Do we have any history buffs in the room? Okay. All right, a few people t tinkering in the history realm. Anybody in the room intimately familiar with the Sons of Liberty? Know your American history? Dan, what did the Sons of Liberty do? Yeah, you're right. So this is a, a band of, of really smart people who were kind of miscreants, and they had realized, they'd kind of woken up to the way that their motherland was being oppressive in a number of ways with laws and, and taxes and organizations and who could farm where and do what, and religious liberties, all of these things. And so this group of people, many of whom you would remember in like namesake-wise, like John Hancock, Sam Adams, Paul Revere, even the infamous Benedict Arnold. These were all people who were part of this organization. And what they did is they were this kind of grassroots underground movement that meant to undermine the religious patriarchy, or not the religious, the um, social hierarchy of the day and the overhanded work of their monarch across the sea. So these people started protests and demonstrations. They, big mobs forced resignations of public officials. They did all sorts of things to kind of instigate a rebellion. Famously, they dumped 92,000 pounds of British tea into the Boston Harbor. Remember that? The Boston Tea Party, most people, that comes to, comes to your mind. And so historians of the United States have really credited this group, this grassroots movement, with the revolution as we know it. Without them instigating all of these things, you don't have Britain, the motherland, coming back with this like fist and oppressive stuff even further, raising up more patriots of this fledgling colonial nation. These people woke up, got together and said, there's a problem and we can do something to fix it. And they literally instigated a rebellion and won, mind you. Pretty amazing history that we're a part of. But here's a problem that sometimes happens with history and present application. A lot of us have that same revolutionary spirit still inside of us, don't we? Like when there's an oppressor, when there's this hand from on high trying to dictate our reality, like we just kind of get stirred up. We want to do something about it. When we wake up to a problem, we want to work our way out of the problem and into the solution. Can I tell you something, though? If that creeps into your spiritual life, that's fatal. We are the problem, spiritually speaking, and can't work ourselves into the solution. We can do all we want making a fuss, protesting the power of sin in our lives. We don't have the power or the organization to break those chains. I'll channel my best Admiral Akbar. It's a trap to believe that we can work our way into the solution. So we learned last week that it's the Holy Spirit's job to shake us awake, to pull us out of the fog that we're going through life in. The scriptures talk about us being asleep at the wheel, dead in our transgressions, completely separated from God by a continental divide that we can't bridge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to, to wake us up to that reality because some of us walk through life and just feel like, I mean, it's all good. I got problems. I got bills to pay. I got relational things, but like, it's fine. It's the Holy Spirit's job to change our attitude from I'm good to woe is me. I am undone. I am a man or woman of unclean lips among an unclean people to change us from we're fine and dandy who needs God to woe we need Jesus. That's the provenient grace of God and the Holy Spirit waking us up to the problem, convicting us of our sin, and convincing us of the goodness of God, offering us a pathway to freedom and salvation. That's the good, provenient work of the Spirit. But God doesn't want to just leave us walking through this world semi-awake to the problem and crushed by the weight of sin. He doesn't want us walking around saying, woe is me, all the time as if there's no hope. It's also the Holy Spirit's job to change our tone from woe is me to Abba, Father. The ability to say, not I'm fine, but not simply I've got no hope, but to say I have found hope 
in Christ. And I know, I know I have confidence that he is going to do and complete the work in me for our spirit to be able to no longer cry, what was me, but Abba, Father, you're so good, and we're so grateful. The book of Ezekiel, I think, shows us kind of how this, the Holy Spirit does this two stages of grace. You remember this story. It's, it's famous. We even sang a song about it this morning. So let's read it at length and then de- debrief a little bit here. Here's what Ezekiel chapter 37 says. The Lord took hold of me, by which he means Ezekiel, and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. Is it coming to light for you? He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Was there, was there any life left in those bones? That's what they're saying. Like they're, they're not even chewy anymore. Like they're completely dried out. There's no hope for these bones. So then he says, son of man, can these bones become living people again? What would your answer be? Well, they're completely dead and dry. So no. But Ezekiel doesn't give a direct answer. He gives a roundabout answer. He doesn't want to say the wrong thing, so he says, Oh, sovereign Lord, only you alone know the answer to that. Just put that one back on God. We do that sometimes. And here's how God responds. He says, Speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, Dry bones, listen or hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I'll put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. And suddenly, as I spoke, there was a rattling noise across the valley. And the bones came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones and then skin covered their bodies but they still had no breath in them. See this? Like, they look alive, but there's no breath in them yet. And then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the wind, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, and breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message he commanded me, and And breath came into their bodies, and they stood up and came to life on their feet as a great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying we have become old and dry bones, and all hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore, prophesy to them and say, This is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord because I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return to the home or to your home in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. Here's kind of like a a, a one-line application for me from this passage for our discussion today. I believe that God doesn't just want to forgive us. He wants to restore us. There's a difference. These people are in judgment because of their sins, and they're off in another nation, in Babylon, freaking out. And they think there's no hope for us. We're we're not the people of God in the place of God anymore. How can we be his people? And he says, listen, I'm not only going to deal with the sins... I'm going to restore you to your land, and I'm going to go one step further and give you the breath of life you needed all along. I will put my spirit in you. God doesn't only desire to forgive you. Huge part. He also desires to restore you. So listen to the way that Ezekiel puts this one chapter earlier without the prophetic vision of dry bones rattling. This is what he says in chapter 36. I, the Lord, will give you a new heart. And I will put my spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive one. Anybody feel like you got a a stony, stubborn heart to some degree? He says, I will put my spirit in you. And you will follow my decrees and be able to obey my regulations. 
Here's what I think Ezekiel is telling us and foreshadowing for a New Testament reality for all of us as believers in Christ. God doesn't simply want to call us righteous. He wants to make us righteous. Jesus did a work on the cross for us, declaring us righteous, those who trust in him in faith. God, from up on high, basically like sitting in the throne room, looks at us, sees the mountain of evidence against us, but because of our washed nature in the blood of Christ, brings down the gavel and says, not guilty. The guilt is gone, and so is the penalty, because the penalty has been on Christ. But he doesn't simply want to bring down the not guilty verdict. He wants to change us into the kind of people that can be empowered by his spirit to hear from him, respond to his word, and obey. He wants to do more than simply declare us righteous. Put it another way, I believe that God doesn't only want to free you from the guilt of your sin. I believe he wants to free you from its power. So, theologically speaking, we deal with the guilt of sin in an act called justification. It's this big theological term that says, because of what Jesus did on the cross, through faith, he has made you just as if you never sinned. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your past, he doesn't see your sins, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And we should be pumped about that. That is a big work, and we should be so stinking grateful. What he does is he takes away the guilt of sin. And there's so many people walking around this world burdened by guilt and shame. Jesus took it. In justification, it deals with our relationship with God, restoring it. Because sin is no longer in the way. So we can experience his favor again. Yes, we need his favor. But in all of this, it's just a relative change. Because God chooses to see us as righteous but hasn't yet made us righteous. We cannot undervalue what God does in justifying us because of Christ, but the Holy Spirit wants to take it deeper. He wants to take it up a notch. He wants to do something even bigger because justification is an act that God does for us from on high. It's foreign to us. It's applied to our lives, but we don't feel the change inside. It's the Holy Spirit's job, though, to get right down deep in there and give birth to new life from the inside. Not simply do something for us, but do something radical in us to transform our lives. As Ezekiel said, to give us a new heart, exchange that stubborn, stony, unresponsive one for one that can hear the word of the Lord and live into it. In theology, we call this regeneration. You may know it as being born again. Can I tell you today, the Holy Spirit wants to give birth to you again. Now that may sound weird. It sounded weird for another person. Jesus deals with this specific topic head on in John chapter 3, where he encounters a Pharisee whose name you probably know. Here's how the story goes. There was a Pharisee, a a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, We know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replies, which I find interesting because he hasn't asked a question, (laughs) very truly I tell you, there is no one who can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Some translations would say born from above, which means born from heaven, same thing. Nicodemus' response, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. Why? Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. So you shouldn't be surprised to me when I say, you, who? (laughs) Who's he talking to? (laughs) You, need to be born again. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound. You can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus' response, what on earth are you talking about? (laughs) How can this be? 
I want to help us process this passage a little bit today by talking about some of the ways that that first century culture would have understood some of this terminology. I love that in the Old Testament foreshadowing of this, it's a corporate event. It's the whole nation of Israel. It just shows the scope that God wants to operate with in our world. But we can't get away from the very personal discussion between Nicodemus and Jesus. Jesus the rabbi and Nicodemus the Jewish religious leader. Now, it's really, really easy for us as church people to read this story, this need to be born again, and immediately look outward. We watch the news, we have conversations with coworkers, and we think to ourselves, don't we? Man, if these people just followed Jesus, they'd get it. They'd have a different perspective. Maybe we wouldn't be talking past each other. Maybe the world would be a better place. I think that's probably right, by and large. But the context of this story tells me that we should be taking a really hard look inside our own hearts before we look to apply this message to anybody else. Jesus talks to Nicodemus, a religious leader, a Pharisee, which means he followed the Torah to a T. Just like Paul, he would have said, according to the law, I am blameless. Jesus looks him square in the eyes and says, you must be born again. What might that mean for us today? So Nicodemus shows up and he talks to Jesus and he starts off, Rabbi, this this notion of respect, and we know that you've come from God because of blah, 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 blah. In the ancient world, they were all about patronizing people. Now, you and I, we don't really like to be patronized, right? In that day, they were like, bring it on, bring me all the praise. So if you were a religious leader, if you were a highfalutin society person, if you were in an elected office or an enforced office, people, before they'd come to you with a question or request, would just puff you up a little bit share all the titles, talk about your glory. And so that's probably what's happening with Nicodemus here. He's saying, man, rabbi, a place of honor. We know you come from God. Try to puff him up a little bit. And Jesus cuts him off, which I find hilarious. Like this passage, doesn't it read a little bit choppy? He doesn't even get to get the question out, which leaves me wondering, what question might he have wanted to ask to begin with? He came to Jesus with a reason. He came at night. He had to leave his work or maybe leave prying eyes to get to Jesus front and center. It tells me that the righteousness that he had through the law felt like there was a void there. Like it wasn't enough. And so he comes to Jesus looking to fill that void just like all of us do. But before he can even get out the question, maybe he was like other people and wanted to say, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We get that elsewhere in the gospel. Or Jesus, how can I be a part of this kingdom that is to come? Maybe like the disciples, he was trying to fight for like a top spot in this new social order that was coming. Maybe, just maybe, he was coming to Jesus to say, Jesus, I don't know how to describe what's happening because of your work and your message in my heart to my religious leader buddies. We don't know what question he's bringing, but here's what I do know. Whenever Jesus speaks to somebody in a conversation, he doesn't miss the mark. In other parts, in other Gospels, it says things like, and he knew their thoughts or intentions and did this. There's so many times in other places where he doesn't even allow religious leaders or authority figures to get words out before he addresses them. So my guess is he is speaking right to the desire of Nicodemus. What would it mean for me to be a part of your kingdom? That's my best guess. And Jesus cuts him off. Maybe he just wanted to get the first word in. Maybe he wanted to hang on this word no. That's my guess because Nicodemus says, we know you're from the Lord. And I think Jesus might have said, let me talk to you about what real knowledge looks like because you don't know anything yet. How can you know anything without being born of the Spirit? Maybe you, like Nicodemus, knew your problem and knew of Jesus And knew and maybe even believed that Jesus had this direct pipeline to God. Like you had to get to him to figure it out. But maybe you don't yet know him in the truest, deepest sense. Trusting him completely to change your life and deal with the problem. And make you become who he has called you to be. Either way, Jesus interjects and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I like to call him Nico. Nico, you don't know anything. To know anything in the real sense, to see the kingdom of God, you must be born 
again. And that throws Nicodemus for a loop, doesn't it? He starts asking questions like, what you talking about, bro? How, how is somebody going to climb back in there? Like, that's an unpleasant, I don't want to see that. He takes it really, really literally. And it makes us, it makes you and I as 21st century readers think, man, he, he had no context for this discussion at all. I want you to know it's not true. In the intertestamental period, which is a big word that means the time between the end of the writing of the Old Testament and the beginning of the writing of the New Testament, which is a few hundred years, there was a really common procedure of God-fearers, which meant Gentiles who were kind of on the fringe of Jewish community, choosing to repent of their sins and their pagan ways, be baptized in repentance, and be circumcised and and entered into the Jewish world, to be converted, proselytized. Do you know what religious leaders in the Jewish community called those people in the intertestamental period? People who were born again. Nicodemus likely knew exactly what term Jesus was referring to here. What he had a problem with is, how does this apply to me? Because in the Jewish world, you repented of your pagan ways. And you got baptized in repentance, you got circumcised, and then you became part of God's favored community. You were a Jew. You were good. But Jesus continues this vein that was also confusing for the other religious leaders in the practice of John the Baptist. Because who is John baptizing out in the wilderness by the Jordan River? Jewish people. (laughs) Not people who were wanting to convert to Judaism, but Jews who said, there's a problem here. I've been awakened to the problem. What is the solution? And his solution was, I am preparing the way through repentance so you can participate in the kingdom that is to come. And remember what John said? John said, I baptize you with water, but the one who is coming after me will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus is continuing this vein, and so he's talking to Nicodemus, and he's using a word he's really familiar with, but Nicodemus is saying, I'm already a Jew. I'm already good. I've been a Jew from birth. I've kept all of the laws. I'm a Pharisee, for heaven's sake. What do you mean I might need to be born again? Well, Jesus cuts right to the the problem here. Look, you are trying to obtain righteousness through the flesh, but flesh gives birth to flesh. You need the spirit to give birth to this spiritual life that you and everybody else in this world needs. You need to be born again. Now, this actual specific illustration of a baby being birthed again is one that's a little bit graphic and intense, but I want to stretch it here. So dive in with me, okay? This is actually an illustration that John Wesley picked up in or picked up on when he was writing his theological works and his sermons. John Wesley talked about the pervenient grace of God, the grace that goes before, which we talked about last week, like fetal development, like the baby in the womb. And just like the text from Ezekiel, having you know, bones and muscles and skin and flesh really being formed. And being alive 100% in the biological sense, but not in the way that even our world likes to talk about life, as being able to have conscious like identity and relationships and experience the world. There's a difference. So in the womb, can babies hear? Yeah, they can. But it's muffled. It's confusing. They don't have the, the parts of their brain fully formed to necessarily understand. Now they can hear their mama's heartbeat. And year and after that, just like those who've been awakened to their spiritual need by the Father, and by the Holy Spirit, can hear his heartbeat. But that doesn't mean we can respond to it the way we're supposed to. Can a baby see in the womb? Most people believe there's at least the, the ocular ability to do it because a baby can open its eyes, can't see far when it comes out, but it can see. But what need is there to use your sight in a dark place like a womb? Can a booby? A booby. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Can a baby feel in the womb? We can come back from this. Can a baby feel in the womb? Yes. But it can't feel all that much, right? It's confined to a little space. It can't even stretch out its arms. Those of you who are or who have been pregnant know what it feels like for a baby to try to be breaking out of there. Like, I've got to get a fully extended arm here. We can feel, sure, just like we can feel when we're spiritually awakened, but we don't have the freedom to go where we want to go and do what we want to do. We're still captive, in a sense, 
to our sin, just like a baby is captive in the womb. And Jesus is saying, look, there's a greater work to be done by the Holy Spirit for you to be able to hear clearly, to see the world through a different lens, to get a new perspective, to be able to see what God is up to and hear the calling and be able to chase after it. And to do so, you must be born again, born of the Spirit, born from above. And in that sense, you'll no longer be captive to your previous way of living, just like a baby is no longer captive to the womb. Now, when a baby comes out of the womb, I am, uh, I've been there not too long ago in the room, it's a confusing experience. (laughs) And the baby, Lord have mercy on that thing, is struggling, can't breathe. I remember my daughter's squinting at me like, what is happening? They're being rubbed down, they're sucking stuff out of their nostrils and their ears, and then they're getting the bath, and then they have to like slowly process the world. Let me just tell you something. When you're born by the Spirit, there's a lot that comes along. We start to see sin at work in the world and sin at work in our lives, and it's overwhelming, it's chaotic, it's dirty, and it's nasty, but we are alive. And God has a plan for us to grow. He doesn't just want us to be spiritual babies forever. He wants us to be birthed to new life and be raised in it and developed. And we're going to talk about that process, the role of the Holy Spirit in that growth next week called sanctification. But today, we can't get away from this message of what Jesus asks of Nicodemus and what's foreshadowed in the book of Ezekiel. Do we need to be born again? Do you need to be born again? A good way to answer this question is to look inside and see, is sin ruling or reigning in your life somewhere? Like, are you a captive to what sin is doing in your life? Let me ask you a question. When you're born again, when you become a Christian, do you never sin? Did somebody get this right? No. Of course, we still fall. We fall short. Sometimes we really intentionally do it. We get messed up. Being born again by the Spirit doesn't mean you're never going to sin, but it means you have the power and freedom not to. It means that rather than being confined by or controlled by the mind of the flesh that we hear about in Romans, we can be governed by the mind of the Spirit. We have a new path, a new way, a new option available to us, those who've been born again. Now, those who are born again, should you be habitually sinning? Because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Paul says, why would you go about continuing to sin when you have the power living inside of you not to? So the question today is, are you controlled by sin? Because Jesus wants to do more than eliminate the guilt of your sin. He wants to take away its power. He wants you to experience real, tangible, actual freedom from that stuff that's been stuck with you. And the formula is the same. It doesn't change. It's not some... like magical thing you got to say or do. It's confession of our sin, confession of our need, and asking him to do a work in us. It comes through faith, the faith that saves us. When we say, Jesus, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips among unclean people. I'm messed up. Will you help me? You know how he responds? He says, yeah, the guilt is gone, and let me give you a helper, the one who's coming after me. Let me put a new heart in you, give you my spirit, the same spirit that raised me from the dead so that you can live here and respond and be birthed into the calling that God has for you. Is that an experience of your life thus far? Are you experiencing and walking in the freedom that God has for you? Don't settle for half the gospel. Jesus died for more than just forgiving you your sin. He wants to free you from its power and dominion in your life. So maybe you're coming like Nicodemus today, and you're saying, like, I I know that there's a need, and I've been trying really stinking hard, but flesh has only given birth to flesh in my life. I've tried hard. I know what's good and right. Like Paul says in Romans 7, I know what's good and holy, but I don't do what I want to do. Maybe today you're coming like Nicodemus saying, how can I participate? What can I do next? And Jesus wants to tell you there's nothing you can do. You must be born again. Will you trust me? Maybe today the idea that you were born in sin and you're messed up is repugnant to you. Like, no. And that is our cultural value today, that we are who we are supposed to be, so let me be me. Maybe you, like many other people, would say, look, I was born this way. 
this is who I am. If God had a role in, in creating me in the first place, then he should be okay with who I am. Here's the call today, I think, of the gospel and what Jesus would say. I think he'd probably say, yeah, okay. You were born that way. You must be born again. Life is hard. Life is complicated. Life is full of so much sin and depravity. Our whole world is messed up. Of course you and I are messed up. What do we need? Not flesh giving birth to flesh, but spirit giving birth to spirit. God would say, yes, you're messed up, but I loved you so much that I came anyway to give you a new way. Will you be born again? You must be born again. So Paul kind of sums all this stuff up in the book of Titus, in this little paragraph, which was probably a creedal statement or something that everybody around would have already said and professed to believe. Here's what he says. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures, our lives full of envy and evil, and we hated each other. Sound familiar? But something changed when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness to us, that awakening grace. He also went a step further and saved us, not because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. It's all by grace through faith. He washed away our sins, dealing with the guilt and the penalty, and gave us, or giving us new birth and new life through the Spirit, Holy Spirit, regeneration. He generously poured out his spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he's made us right in his sight and given us the confidence that we too will inherit eternal life. Today, don't settle for half the gospel. Don't just trust Jesus to deal with the sins of the past. Trust him to deal with the sin that's inside of you today by the power of his spirit and just see what he gives birth to in your life. It never comes by our own strength. But it comes through our cooperation. We say, Lord, we know the problem. And we are finally convinced. Sometimes it takes us a while. We want to try real hard. We're finally convinced that we can't do it without you. So we're turning away. We're giving it all to you. And we're trusting in you today for new life and new hope and new direction and new power. Because true sons and daughters of liberty recognize that even if we're awake to the problem, we can't work our way to the solution. We need to trust the big boy on the block who's actually done what we want to do. That has come in the form of a human being and defeated sin and death on the cross and was raised to new life by the Spirit. He wants to give you that same Spirit today.